Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Scott Carter, the Director of Facilities, Operations, and Events at the University of Maryland Athletics Department. Today, we're going to discuss preparing for kickoff, safety, and security concerns. Welcome, Scott. Thank you for joining us today. Angela, great to see you. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you as our guest. I know you've worked at several universities and athletic facilities and events. This includes the University of Texas at Austin, James Madison, Auburn, and now the University of Maryland. So in your role, have you noticed any major differences between how these different athletic programs operate? Yeah, I think uh, everywhere is different, which is probably common sense, but depending on the size uh, of your uh, school, your athletic department, everything can kind of uh, vary a little bit from place to place. Um, given the last few years and the last 10 years or so and the impact on safety and security at events, a lot of different um, things have progressed from years ago when I started. It was simply um, lock up with your ticket and come on in. And now, as we know, there's a lot di more different steps to that. There's a lot of ways to do it uh, between metal detectors and all sorts of new technology. So um, things have grown over the years, for sure. Um, so now you're seeing even at smaller places, smaller schools are having some of the same systems and procedures as the larger schools. So when you think of your large power five schools or your group of five schools or even um, division two schools, you know, division three schools, a lot of these things are going into place to really secure your facilities on game days when having large groups of people together. So um, years ago, different different steps and, and styles for different people, but now you're kind of seeing the emphasis really come more to the forefront um, with current events. So that you mentioned something interesting about the ticketing piece and how mm -hmm. that's changed. They used to stub the the ticket, the physical tickets, and now people have digital tickets or at least sure. tickets that are going to be scanned using using machines or devices. Mm -hmm. So how long ago has that transition been implemented and and what really has had the impact on those who are trying to facilitate the entrance of spectators into a venue yeah digital ticketing and and um, technology in that uh, space has really come a long way even in the past 10 years just think of when you might have gotten your first iphone for some of you know, myself, it was probably 10, 12 years ago, but really as that's progressed you know, with, with smartphones and people able to bring that um, technology with them, um, you, you've seen that shift in digital ticketing. So um, there are, depending on who you ask, there are pros and cons to it. They're from the ticket office side. It's easier to email everyone tickets or send out a link. Um, from an operational perspective, um, you bring tickets, it's in your pocket. Well, you show up to a, a stadium of 50, 80, 100,000 people, um, a lot of times you get the, well, I can't connect to the Wi-Fi or my phone died or uh, all those kinds of lines. So there's different pros and cons. I think the biggest pro is uh, you're able to access those tickets. Uh, it's in a safe location. You know, you can drop a ticket stub. Um, you can hand it off. Um, you're probably not going to hand someone a phone. Now, do you get into the, the spectrum of, well, I'm going to screenshot it and send it to you? Of course you do. Uh, but a lot of times, as we say, well, the, it'll scan the first time. It won't scan the second, third, or fourth time if you're trying to get your friends in or if you sold it, different things like that. So I think there's a lot of pros and cons to it. I think it helps not only with tracking and you can, you know, you get a timestamp of when that scan. So especially from a security standpoint, especially during even during COVID times, if you're using your ticket correctly, you knew when Angela Hazlett used that ticket to come into that game, um, if she was in fact still using that ticket, but you know when that came in. So it, it gives you that kind of data set as well. But um, now and then you still run into um, little instances of, you know, screenshots, things like that. So a lot of, a lot of programs are moving that way, digital ticketing, um, some still do have hard hard stock printing mailing tickets out so um it's and then once again that's a decision for each athletic department to make but there's from a security standpoint it's definitely um that hasn't eliminated all of the security and the counterfeitness of tickets but at least it's it's made it harder and sometimes that's a victory in itself 
And you say you've noticed that evolution in the last 10 to 12 years, roughly, as far as people moving away from the paper ticketing procedure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I think, um, yeah, just it's it, things change over time. And as tickets and not, you're not just selling tickets to your home games, you're selling tickets to away games, to bowl trips, to postseason, just the frequency. And now you're ticketing not just football and basketball, you're ticketing 15 to 20 sports sometimes. So it's much easier to be able to send things out in advance, um, get things to people where they are versus them having to come to you uh, on campus or to more local box office if you're a professional organization maybe they can swing by throughout the week but I think it's a ease of accessibility now that enables people to purchase tickets online get them pretty much almost immediately or be able to once you do ticket renewals send that all out and you've got your stuff for the season um, and, it, and it makes things uh, a bit easier for a lot of different folks some you people really miss the hard tickets you made a really interesting comment about being able to know when people's tickets are scanned. Do you mm -hmm. use that kind of that data to help you with staffing to to move people, like find out the trends and patterns of when people are entering a game? And um, does that does it help you with the staffing? Yeah, absolutely. I think to be able to get statistics on when and how people are entering your facility. So especially especially coming out of COVID, as a lot of people across across the country in different areas hit uh, staffing issues, especially for game days when you need several hundred people as event staff or several hundred people to be uh, concessionaires, things like that. Uh, to be able to pull data, um, at least on a very elementary level of how many people are coming through this quadrant of your stadium definitely lets you staff up at that area. Uh, at, at my time at Auburn, we kind of got into a fairly good ritual of we knew kind of our 90 minutes, we were open pregame for a football game of where we needed to staff first for that first 20 minutes. And then we could kind of pivot around as necessary. We knew that really most games, but especially depending on a, a big game against a higher level opponent, that the students are going to be there early. They're going to line up. They're going to be outside. So our main focus right as we opened was getting them in and inside. And once we got that cleared, we could pull people from those uh, walk through metal detectors, those bag check tables, and spread them out a little bit elsewhere. Because we knew another quadrant of our stadium was then going to be hit by the general public from the tailgating lots, from the walking from the downtown area, things like that. So once we knew we got the mass of the students in, the big cluster at the gates, that definitely helped us pull those people elsewhere to kind of fill out the rest of our staffing model. So there is that helps us kind of get that. Um, higher level data usage, it's it's definitely helpful to have. And it's interesting that the students actually come in early. I want to talk just briefly. I know at LSU, they've had actually sec increased security, um, their in-stadium security procedures um, because of one of their gymnasts, Olivia Dunn, who has uh -huh. uh, received a lot of attention and they've had to kind of change some procedures. So what are your procedures when you have celebrities or famous people or people that are getting kind of a lot of attention, um, yeah. either athletes or spectators? How do you manage that? Yeah, I think it, uh, what always helps is to know if they're coming. And sometimes you do and sometimes you don't. Um, I think for having uh, special guests in attendance is helpful. Uh, special guests when it's a student athlete uh, like Olivia or like... Um, at Auburn, um, having a, an Olympic gymnast, uh, Suni Lee as well. <laughs> Sorry, the name escaped me for a second. Suni Lee on campus as well. Yeah, you got to keep an eye out for that. Um, you know, Auburn basketball and Charles Barkley always comes around. He's a big supporter of the program there. So knowing when these people are coming in games and keeping an eye out um, is always helpful. And you try to work with them. And if they need additional um event staff around them um, to make sure people aren't there. They're allowed to enjoy the game too. So we want to make sure they're able to do that, but positioning folks with them uh, um, so they're not hound biographs or pictures. They're, they're all lovely, lovely people and they're willing to do that, but sometimes they kind of need to be able to leave and go home. So we try to help them out where they can for special VIPs. Um, other requests that may come up, um, you know, pro athletes jump in all the time, things like that. And you might just want to attend the game, but Sometimes it's good to know when those people show up. You might need to step in or say, how can we help? Do you need someone 
from event staff or campus university police, things like that around as well. Being in this area as well, um, up here next close to Washington, DC, um, we time to time can have some special guests from uh, Washington, DC, from um, a political realm as well. So when those are involved, we tend to have um, previous contact with some of their staff, some of their security, uh, whether that's a, a federal agency provided or, or just uh, their own um, people um, to reach out in advance working with campus um, police and kind of their details of how they're getting in, where they're sitting, where they're going. Once again, great things to have, uh, information to have so we know where they're sitting, if something happens, uh, if we need to get them out. Um, it's all just, it's a lot of it's just pre prior communication, whether they're, a, you know, like you said, a celebrity and they're a guest of our development department, or they're uh, maybe a more famous uh, student at the university or a, uh, a friend from Washington, D.C. down the street. It's just working in advance with those departments um, and knowing, uh, meeting, doing walkthroughs, you know, show them your facilities, show them how they're coming through, how they're going to get to their seats, um, where they're parking, where can we get them out if something happens. It it's all just leads to prior communication. Is it fair to say that the political figures that come to an athletic event may have different protocols or different requirements as far as uh, safety and security? Yeah, they'll usually have um, a couple more people dedicated to them, uh, which is assumed and makes sense. Uh, but it's it's still us working with them. And then they have our contact information. We may have some of our own university security police people around the area just to keep an eyes watch out for anything that may happen but you know we want them to come we want them to visit we want them to enjoy the game uh, if they're here um by themselves or, or with some coworkers or with their families oftentimes we want them to be able to enjoy their game too and their visit to campus so we try to make things streamlined and easy for them and we're here to help their people as best as much as we can and, and that's how you um it's been pretty smooth so far and you've had the uh, experience of being part of ESPN's College Game Day mm -hmm. and, and having that experience and hosting a special media event. Um, you don't always have a lot of advance notice of where mm -hmm. ESPN is going to go. Um, and, and even just broadcasting games in general, sometimes they're setting the schedule of what games they're going to show or air. Um, talk to me about dealing with the media and the last minute requests and changes that, how does that impact what you do? Yeah, the, the nature of, especially college football these days is with uh, game time windows. Uh, sometimes you'll, you'll know games right now. Right now we know our first three games of the season. Um, TV has already announced those. Those are some of your non-conference games. But as you, as you know, you get into the thick of it, you get into conference play, they kind of wait and to announce times to kind of pick those premier matchups for TV. So that might be a two week window out. That might be a six day window. So you're, you're, you're excuse me, you're going to find out Saturday night, the week before of your next Saturday's game. So um, on that regard, you just try to communicate and everyone knows you have a game. So you're not surprising anybody. So uh, <laughs> once we know that, you know, I sent an email out to way too many people that should be on an email uh, about, <laughs> Hey, our game's at three 30 next Saturday. And everyone plans accordingly. So it doesn't stop people from staffing or getting ready. It's just finalizing that time so they can kind of shift what they're doing. Um, same thing with your, your ESPN college game days, your, your pregame shows, uh, your Fox noon kickoffs, things like that. So uh, you tend to find those out on a similar timeline. Sometimes you may, um, you know, hear of, hey, you made a short list or things like that. But Really, once that comes in, um, they're exciting to have. You know, they they roll all those TV trucks into town. Um, I know for um, JMU back in 2014 or 2015, I think it was the first time that we hosted there. Uh, that was exciting, but hadn't been done there before, which is pretty cool. So uh, we had to go stake out some space real quick. Uh, we ended up there, there in the quad on campus. And then lo and behold, I think late Tuesday or early Wednesday, all the trucks came rolling down and they started building the stage. So that's exciting to have them on campus but then that's funny you start working with their security people and they have their own detail and they're sure they're they're working with our provider there of event staff people to staff and watch stage all week uh things like that but um that becomes another event in of itself in uh besides your football game besides whatever you may help else have going on on game day 
So it's exciting to have those, but um, it adds another piece to it. Um, we did that JMU, obviously. Uh, we did a, the in arena basketball and twice at Auburn, which was new there as well. And so that's that's putting it's a, a little bit smaller, you know, but one time we had it earlier in the day where you have a little more setup. One time it was immediately pregame because we had the early game. Um, so they literally went off air and then we threw the ball in the air. So we had to work with them. Okay, you're gonna be off to the side. You got to move some donor seats around. They were great and wonderful. They're excited to be right there by the, the TV action as well. So those things and those people, ESPN, they they it's pretty turnkey for them at this point. They know what they're doing. Um, and it's the same people and over over and over. So you build those relationships, you know what to expect from those guys. So they're always great to work with. And then for more for your standard media, depending on the game, depending who you're playing, depending who might be in attendance, depending what's going on, working closely with your sports information, your media relations departments to help handle your more standard photo, video, print media, people covering the game is super important as well. A lot of your credentialing systems for your athletic department will come through departments like mine, um, your event management departments to put together that, that system and process for everyone attending a game, but really relying on them to help determine um, who's approved, who's not approved from a media print perspective. That's super helpful. We work together on, on TV crews coming in and to broadcast the game, but to know who's who's legit and who's not to come cover this game and who needs to go where uh, relying on our folks who know those people um, in sports info much better than I is super helpful. And they've, they've been great, but yeah, it's another moving piece of a good amount of people, whether you're at a Texas, an Auburn, a JMU, Maryland, uh, it could be a smaller group. It could be a much larger group. And it's really important, especially if they have field access or press conference access, um, knowing who's where, knowing that they know where to go, things like that. So and all once again, common theme going back to communication and sharing that information with people um, is, is vital, vitally important. And you've worked at some large stadiums. I, I mean, uh, University of Maryland had hosts about the 54,000 people, Auburn, 87,000 people. Mm -hmm. I imagine there's lots of special considerations when you're hosting um, that many spec or the potential for that many spectators. So talk to me about like, um, safety and security strategies are they different for larger venues like that um, and is there this tension between costs and and benefits um, what are your thoughts on that yeah I think now you know, what you're seeing more with larger football stadiums and basketball or multi-use arenas I think those things are starting to be more consistent across the board um, not only are schools recognizing the need themselves for, for more safety and security procedures, but also the conferences. Um, I know years ago um, at Auburn, it was working with the SEC at the time of, you know, some schools that already initiated walkthrough metal detectors and things like that. Um, we had started a year early. They, there was a requirement to have it in place by, so everyone had it in place by, I want to say it was 27 or 18 or tw uh, probably 20, 2018. Um, getting that in place. And then it was slowly segueing to the arenas. Some people did them, some people didn't. Um, so here at Maryland, we have metal detectors at football and at here at arena for a basketball game. So um, I think the concentration right now is the larger groups of people where you see it's okay, well, some schools have metal detectors at baseball games, some have them at softball games, some have, a, have them at outdoor events, other outdoor events, soccer games, things like that. And I think from there, it's it's kind of based on really doing uh, a good security assessment, um, working with your campus safety, working with your university, saying, um, is there a great need? Is there a great risk for some of these things there? The answer like, can always be, yes, put it out there. But you said if you're going to put 20 metal detectors at 40 baseball games, uh, that adds up. Um, and sometimes, well, yeah. Yeah. And it may be like, you know, the LSU, with, like we talked about earlier, Olivia mm -hmm. Dunn, they may want to use a procedure like that because of, of certain risks to certain athletes. Um, yeah. So lots of things to be concerned with. And, and what about the usage of drones? I know that has increased in recent uh -huh. years. And and are you guys in a restricted airspace there in, in College mm -hmm. Park, Maryland, being so close to the nation's capital? Like, talk to me about drones and, and how that's, that's really changed some uh, strategies for you. Yeah, once again, th things you, you didn't, really need to worry about too much 10 years ago is now 
a fairly common theme throughout, you know, live events, not just sports, but any mass gathering uh, are, are, is drones. Um, and it's not just now just a, uh, you know, a, a hobby. I mean, we even, you know, communications departments uh, across the country for athletics have drones themselves to capture uh, film and content and great things for putting online. Um, I know at Auburn, our, our folks there had them. They had one with a little Auburn helmet on top of it that would fly over and it, is, it was very well branded. Um, but we, we need to know when that's going up because then you'd see people in the parking lots with them. And, and we test used to test cool things like there's um, drone detecting software that um, through um, antennas, they can kind of sense where people are going and then they can track down where the controller is and you dispatch a police officer and they ask them nicely to please take down the drone. Um, but he, sometimes, you you know, you work with your people. If someone says, oh, yeah, we're going to film the, the team walking the stadium with the drone, that's information my department needs to know so I can relate that to campus police because if they see a drone flying down the street, probably not the greatest thing in the world. Here at Maryland, like you mentioned, we are eight miles from smack dab, the National Mall in the middle of D.C., so um, three major airports um, right around us. So it is very critical that if people are using drones, that there's a, there's a, there's a process through campus, our police department, um, there's an FAA component as well. So even if it's just we're trying to film stuff for, you know, stadium overshots for, for just general B-roll or whatever it may be, we still need to go, you still do it the right way, still need to have a, um, approval, you need to have you be licensed, whatever it may be, still need to go through the process. So questions get asked, we can answer them. We did it the right way. Other places across the country, maybe more of a relaxed. There's probably some policies in place for approval for general use and approval for game day use. Um, so definitely check with your local university police department or your athletic department, but um, it might be a little more commonplace, but here it's, yeah, just all the things we're surrounded by and right next to, it's a little more sensitive of, of things flying around the air. So it's always good to know when those things are happening and that we help people um, accomplish their goals in the right way. Digital ticketing, metal detectors, mm -hmm. drones, what else has changed in, in the last 10, 12 years for you? I mean, yeah, it's it's come a long way. I think it's just continuing to look at okay, what's next? And, you know, even metal detectors, which was a big thing now five years ago, we all know we're using this metal detector um, that we all know and love, uh, not just from the airport, but other places. That technology is always changing. You're getting smaller ones, you're getting lighter ones, you're getting um, just the mat you walk over that just kind of scans you. So as the technology increases, um, I think that'll be interesting to monitor, especially as some stadiums college football stadiums, some are older um, and very, you know, designed years ago. So how do you put back in more equipment into older, uh, you know, facades on the side of stadiums, things like that. So it's making the decision of what what's really needed of, are you good with what you have? You're getting everyone on time. It's safe. It's good. Versus, you know, it's like getting a new phone every two years. You can get a new phone every two years if you want to. Um, but there's probably the cost to redo a hundred metal detectors every couple of years. It's probably more than you're going to want to spend. So keeping on that technology, you know, NFL programs, things like that, um, increases in credentialing. You can, you know, scan things, photo recognition things. It, it's, there's a lot more. So I think it it's really comes down to a decision of your department, your athletic department, talking about what makes the most sense for you guys based on your security and risk assessments of your facility, of your events, of your area, and kind of tailoring um, what fits best for you, for you, what fits best financially for you. Because <laughs> like you said, that does factor in sometimes uh, on best how you use things. Um, you can use metal detectors at different facilities. You can move things around. You know, you you only need a hundred of them for football season. You can move things around to use right. other places. So right. uh, maybe there's um, opportunities to use things on campus, share things. Um, you know, we have to put different departments getting maybe government assistance, grants, things like that to help set security measures. So there's a lot of options out there. So I'd recommend people, if they're looking to increase or do something new, definitely take a look at what, what's out there and 
um, see what, what works best for you. You mentioned uh, about what's next, and the University of Maryland's president has expressed a commitment for the university to be a fossil fuel uh, power plant under the next gen energy program by 2035. Mm -hmm. So has there been discussion within athletics about how this expectation to be more carbon neutral campus is going to impact athletic facilities? Yeah, I think right now the big one that we see on more day to day basis is, is a lot more from the sustainability efforts. Um, especially on game days, and a lot of that's trash recycling, those efforts on, on how much is produced. Um, you can say, I guess we don't have a lot of paper tickets anymore, so that kind of helps. But um, really, uh, across campus, really sustainability efforts has been a, a big thing the last couple of years of, you know, reducing the amount of waste, uh, recyclables, um, you know, and, and even all the small stuff, straws, cup lids, things like that, things that we can reduce or use again um, is definitely something they pushed for a lot recently here. So I'd look for that to continue to continue. Um, but then as you look at, you know, capital projects and facilities, I'm sure those things in, are being taken into consideration. Um, different green spaces, um, solar is an option. I've seen different places as well. Um, as we continue to build, I'm sure that'll factor in somehow, not only with athletic facilities, but different facilities on campus as that, as that was, as we progress as well. Have you heard any mandates or questions or discussion on how directly that will impact you? I mean, not just going mm -hmm. forward in the planning for re revamping buildings or building new new facilities, but any particular changes to existing facilities that you've heard discussions that to kind of help create this sustainable uh, carbon neutral type of um, mm -hmm. facility. Uh, not not a tremendous amount. I know the, the more recent facility upgrade we did at the, our football stadium is we just changed out all of our older lights to LED lighting. So that's more of an efficiency and electricity kind of uh, helping cost, not only cost there, but impact on the university. So little things like that as we go, but I'm sure there'll be, there'll be more to come in the near future. And you, you know, talking about the future, um, it just, if you could pick one thing that you think is going to be the next change in security and safety procedures in college athletics, what would be the very next thing that you envision happening? Man, I think everything's kind of slowly combining between digital ticketing and digital parking and minimizing the ingress, egress. I think at some point, kind of like those uh, Amazon stores where you can just walk in, walk out. I think at some point, someone's going to come up with just an easy way to get people straight in and get people straight out. I don't know what that is. I'm not an engineer. I'm not a scientist, but <laughs> I'm, I'm sure we're headed there in some kind of magical fast pass kind of way of you've got your ticket and you just walk in with your phone in your pocket and um, somehow the powers that be make that happen. But I think the impact from security is really trending towards how do you maximize the customer service and the fan experience. I think that's where we're headed. So anything that increases that more while maintaining that that high level of safety and security that you need to have, I think that's kind of our next step. Great. Scott, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate your, your insight into preparing for kickoff and safety and security concerns. So thank you for, for sharing your expertise. And I look forward to your prediction if coming true of what the future of safety and security in college athletics will look like. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Angela. <laughs> Thanks to your viewers for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. We will see you next time. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.